for us to be a part of your kingdom, be a part of your people as we come together and uh, submit ourselves unto your word, unto your authority, or as we seek uh, your wisdom and your guidance that you've provided through your revelation of yourself to us, through your word. Father, I pray today that my words would be yours, and that you would speak through me to your people. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I know I've said this before, but, but it, I'm going to use this again. Uh, if, if you were ever a kid, most of us were, and if you're a kid now, you get this. There was a time at P.E. that many kids feared. I loved this time at P.E., by the way. But many kids feared. It's when the P.E. teacher would pick the two best athletes and say, come on up. And they would pick their teams, and usually something for like dodgeball. And I loved it because I was always a captain. Go ahead and applaud now. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. But we, they would pick if you take. And now you know how this goes. Right? You get the two guys up there, whoever it is, and they would pick who? They'd pick the best players. So the first guy would pick, you know, somebody over here, that's the best player. Hey, he got first pick. And then the next guy picks the second man. It goes all the way down until you got the poor saps at the end. And they're standing there, man, nobody ever picks me. And we, we look at this. And some of you were those guys. That was you. That's okay. And we look at that, and that is a common thing, especially when we look at sports. We see that in businesses. We see that all across the world. We want to put together the best teams we can. And because that's what we look at as we draw success from that. What's interesting is the church does the opposite. God says, I want the worst. I want the dirt bags. Oh, and you're all here. <laughs> But God says, I don't, God looks at this and says, I want those who are broken because it's in the weak that God has made strong. And we look at it, and for us, we have this notion where it's this counterintuitive thing where I want the best team. And I can tell you as a pastor, you look at this and say, God, I want the best team to run children's ministry. And I look at who he gave me, and it's Christy Bozart. <laughs> She's fantastic, by the way. <laughs> She's great. But we look at this and, do, and God says, yes, I want the best, but I got you. Uh, come on, God. But we, we look, that's really the dynamic of the church is really built around this. Now, there are those who are stronger in their faith, and we have a unique call by God to help those who are weak and those who are failing. And that's the buildup of the church. That's how the church is designed. And if you'll join me in Romans chapter 15, we're going to see this lived out as Paul addresses this to the church in Rome. As we continue on in our, our journey through uh, the book of Romans, we're nearing the end. But today we're going to cover the first 13 verses of chapter 15 in the book of Romans. And I'm reading from the ESV, which I'll leave it at that. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the people extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse uh, will come, even he who rises to the rule of the Gentiles, and him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now this, this whole section starts off with something that, that I find very fascinating for us, because it is, to me, at times counterproductive. i got to turn my thing on here. Okay, we, we, this whole section starts with... We go here. So it's something that I find counterproductive. The first thing right out of the gate is there's this shift of focus. So we're not focused on our own fleshly desires and what we want. The design is for those who are strong in the faith to be focused on helping the weak failures 
in the faith. Now, that is counterintuitive, isn't it? We, 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 I want to focus upon me. How do I get better? How do I get stronger? How do I get further? Well, the dynamic of going further with Christ is you submit yourself to helping those who are struggling. That is difficult for us to do. You see, we have this shift of focus. Now, why do we do this? It's for our neighbor's good. And so we do this to, in order to build those up so that not only do you get stronger in your faith, but they get stronger in their faith. And what happens? The body of Christ gets stronger. And that's the dynamic, and that's what God, and Paul is talking about here as he's speaking to the Roman church. Remember, we've got Jewish uh, converts to Christianity, and we have Gentile believers. And the Jews understand the entirety of the Old Testament. For the most part, they look, this is, this is them. This is what they, now the Gentiles don't have it. So what do they have to do? They have to be built up in understanding this. We have to look at this, and what are they going to be built up into? And so we have to consider that, because oftentimes with this, maybe it's being built up into being a more responsible adult. Perhaps that's it. But maybe it's we're being built up into, you know, getting more stuff. Maybe that's it. What are we really focusing on building others up into? We'll continue on that in a moment, because first we want to take a side step and go, really the example for doing this is Jesus Christ. The example that we have is having had this lived out is in the, in the person of Jesus Christ as he comes upon the earth and walks upon the earth. He didn't need to do that, but he did, and he did it out of his love for us. Amen. And so we look at this, and, and the fascinating thing about Christ, I had a, a pastor tell me this one time, and, and you kind of know this as you read through the Gospels, but it's not until somebody says it that you think, holy cow, he's right. I had a pastor tell me one time, you know Jesus did all these miracles, right? And I said, yeah, of course I know he did these miracles. It's fascinating. It's, you know, he had all the power of God, but he never used it to benefit himself. And I thought, well, that's amazing. Anytime he pulled off a miracle, anytime he did it, it was, there was two things going on there. One is he was helping somebody else out, and he was, but he was also drawing others to him. But the dynamic here is he never used his power to benefit himself. He could have gone down off that cross anytime he wanted he could, have, he could have wiped everything else. I'm done. This is, these people are crazy. He would have made a day, they, but then we'd all be lost. But what we see happen here is he didn't claim his own rights. What he did was submitted himself to the will of the Father in order that we could be saved. And that's a fascinating thing. Here you have God, the God of the universe, and comes in the flesh and walks upon the earth for the sole purpose of saving the weak. That's fascinating to me. And that's the model that we have as we look at this, uh, as we look to live this out. We see in Philippians, Paul writes, Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we have this recognition of here's this is our Savior. Comes out of heaven, puts on flesh, walks upon the earth with the sole purpose of saving the weak. That's our model. And it's interesting for us because oftentimes when we find people that are weak in the church, there's a couple of responses we have. So if let's say you have a proclivity to, I don't know, drugs. Let's say you have a drug issue. And you come in to church a couple weeks from Now, first off, most people have a drug issue and they're actively using, oftentimes, avoid church. I remember when, when I was early on in my faith and, and if I had a sin issue, the last place I wanted to be sitting was a church. Because, man, I didn't want that conviction. This guy's going to tell me this is what God says. I don't want to go there. But so I was just go with me down this path. So you, you haven't shown up for church in a couple weeks, and we have, you know, you've got a couple folks that have been working with you and, and talking with you and all that, you're building up these relationships, and, and all of a sudden you drop off the radar. And somebody finds out, hey, such and such is, is using again. Now there's a couple responses, one that's very common in many churches, hopefully this doesn't happen here, but one that's very common in many churches is, hey, you got a problem with drugs, and you're using, oh my goodness, you dirtbag. <laughs> Did you get your life together? We told you. Now, that's one response. And oftentimes, that's what happens within the church. That's oftentimes what happens with many Christians. Is we walk away. Ah, I can't believe you. What a horrible person. But that's not the right response. You see, if somebody's failing, what are we called to do? We that are stronger in the faith. Go help them out. Let me put that thing on so you get the needle in right. No, not like that. <laughs> You're terrible. Don't do that. Don't do that at all. That would be a terrible thing to do. 
can't believe the pastor would say it. <laughs> so horrific. This will be my last sermon here at Crossroads. <laughs> Thank you for coming. But really, so we have to look at this in terms of, we have to understand what is it that we're building others up in. But before I get into that, we have this misnomer of love when it comes to helping others. Oftentimes, I see moms struggle with this much more than I see dads, especially dads in the church. Now, if my child, anyone, pick, take your pick, because any of them could do this, takes a fork and is running around the house, ah, I got a fork, ah, 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 and they're stabbing others as little siblings. Well, that's normal in my house, that's fine. We don't stop that. But they go to a, a, an outlet in the wall, and they're going to stick the thing in the outlet. Now, every mom knows, ooh, ooh, stop them. And every dad says, ha, let's see what happens. I ain't going to do that again. Now, luckily, moms are usually there first because they stop them. In my house, that's why some of the kids have white hair. Stuck it in. Dad was watching them that day. Anyways, well, let's see what happens. But just, so we have this misnomer of love that oftentimes we want to protect people from the bad things. And so in some circumstances, that's okay. That's what we want to do. We do protect. But there are other elements where we have to really be honest with people and say, you know, this is an issue of sin in your life, and it's going to destroy you. This is an issue that when we look at this, it is not going to be something that is going to work out well for you. I don't know if you, if you heard of the case, uh, it was this Texas teenager, and then there was a psychologist associated with the case that coined the phrase affluenza. And affluenza, if you're not familiar with it, is when a parent basically gives a child everything they want, they, have, they want for nothing, and then ultimately the child becomes a spoiled brat. And, and they've coined this other phrase of affluenza, I've heard it as overindulgence, uh, in, within the psychology realm, and so we have overindulged children. And what it is, is you give them everything they want, and then they become spoiled. Now, we have to look at this in terms of recognizing, sometimes it's this notion of giving people what they want isn't really love. You see, in our eyes, oftentimes it equates. Well, you want this, I'm going to give this to you. So we have to come back to what is it really that we're building others up in? And we have to look at this. What is it that we, we, we want to build people up? What we want to build them up into is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We want to build them up to be more Christ-like. Because that's really what the goal of all this is, is that in my life I will become more and more like Christ. The things that Christ did, that's what I'll start to reflect. That's what I'll be living out in my life. Those are the things that I desire to do. So as it looks towards building others up, you may come to me and say, Steve, I, we, I have, I'm struggling with such and such and such and such. And I need money. And I'll, it, usually I'll say, okay, I'll give you money. You come back again the next week, and I, you see, I'm struggling with such and such and such and such. I need money. Now, Pastor Steve, I say, I'm broke. Yeah. Go talk to Bill. Yeah. No. <laughs> what we, we do is, why is this an ongoing issue? What's going on here? How do we get you to live your life for Christ? Because when you live our lives for Christ, guess what? We become more responsible people. That's one of the things that naturally happens. If I start living my life for Christ, I have to first off own responsibility for my own sin. And that's one of the things that gets in the way. So I own my own sin and I start to become more responsible. And that's this dynamic of growing up in Christ. And one of the things within the church is it is designed to do that. And so you have older Christians, not necessarily by age, but older Christians who within their walks of Christ are more mature. And then you pair them up with younger Christians who are going to fail. And then we build one another up. And the whole point of this is to build each other up towards being more Christ-like, building each other up in Christ. And as we, as we do this, what we start to look at is the model of sacrifice in this, because this does require sacrifice of us is that Christ's actions were consistently put to others first with the intention of drawing them into right relationship with God. Now this is interesting because we look at the Gospels and we understand how Jesus worked, and most of us know, and we look at how did Jesus respond to people. And we look, and we'll look, well, he healed the lame. He gave sight to them, he made button balls, and threw them in their eyes. And they gave, then all of a sudden they could see. He went and touched people, healed them. That's what he did with the week. He brought, he was the nice to the prostitutes and then told her, don't sin anymore. But he forgave their sin. We look at, that's what we think of. What did Jesus do with the religious elite? He called them on it. 
He called them out. That's exactly what he did. He looked at them and the religious elite. And one of the things that's interesting, I'm going to ask you this question in a moment. One of the interesting things is he had a very weird encounter with the religious elite who tried to make fun of him uh, by his birth and all that. But then he identifies who their father truly is. And that's what's interesting as we look at this. So Jesus didn't just deal with those who were broken and beaten. He also dealt with those who would be in a position, those who we should have been able, those who around them should have recognized who he was and should have understood what the word of God had said about what he was going to be there doing. But they didn't recognize him. They had their own motives, their own desires. And I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to speak about that in a moment. And that's something that, that oftentimes we see because as we turn into to what Paul does next is he identifies, I, I just got to look at this and say, how in the world do we do this? The whole world is telling us to do the opposite. Put together the best team you can put together. Put together the strongest. Put together the, all, it, we, we have this, this notion of doing that, but the word of God says do the opposite. The strong need to be working and helping the, the weak that are failing. And so we have the, this, so what do we get? Well, we first start off with the instruction from God's word. And Paul writes in here uh, that, that really it's through the scriptures. We see elsewhere Paul states in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. We see elsewhere in Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews states, Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he created the world. A couple things going on there that we have to recognize is when we look at the Scriptures, we have to look at it through the lens of God has accomplished the salvation for us through Jesus Christ. And so as we look at the Old Testament, what we should be able to do is as we turn to the pages, we should say, where is Jesus on this page? Because he's all over, he's dripping all over the, the, the entirety of Scripture. And so as we go through, we read Scripture in light of Christ having come and Christ having brought with Him salvation for us. And so we look at that, and, and as we, we, we address this, it allows us to see things like what Paul states to the Corinthian church. Now these things, typically speaking of, of the history of Israel, for examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. And again, in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for your instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So when we look at this, what we have to grasp is, is God has written all this, one, for our instructions, so we know the intention of God, we know the desire of God, we know who God is. And that's important, especially when we turn to the church. Because realistically, the ones who are responsible for the, the now what we call the, the, the gospel and taking out the message of hope into the world is us. God has entrusted that to you. If you're a saint, that's your job. You may not have known that. You may have thought, I'm here to float through, man. They, I was naked yesterday, and they went down the bus, and they got me clothes. Man, I, hey, Dad, I'm going to see if they'll give me a hamburger or something. No, that's not. Your job is to take the gospel out to the world. And we have to understand that you're given one weapon, and that's the Bible. I had a conversation with my kids this, this last day. One of their, my younger ones are always wanting to do sword fights. And, and I'm talking with them, and, and they're ready. I mean, Dad, we're ready for battle. So, well, what do you get ready for battle with? What's the one weapon a Christian has? You go through the whole thing. The only weapon we get is the Bible. And so, what do we do? Throw it at somebody? No. You've got to know how to use this thing. And that's the interesting thing as we look at this. God's intention is to really clarify and identify your inner relationship with Him, whether you know it or not. The dynamics of that relationship could be good. You could be saved and, and have received salvation through Jesus Christ, accepted the mercy and grace that God has offered you. Or your relationship may not be so good. You're going to find out one day that you did have this relationship with Him, whether you wanted it or not. You get the bad relationship just by nature of being born. See, that's what the problem was with this woman in the garden. <coughs> Nobody caught that. You have to go back and watch the video. So that's the problem in the garden. See, we inherit that by birth. I'm born into sin. Now, nobody had to teach me how to lie, how to cheat, how to steal. I was pretty good at it. Straight out of the gates. I remember at five years old, I tried to steal a pack of Bubblicious from the store. My mom caught me. But I had my mom, because I was foolish. I had my hand in my pocket. Five years old, walking around the store with my hand in my pocket. What you got in your pocket? I got nothing in my pocket, Mom. Let me see what's in your pocket. Oh, man, I got a pocket. Bubblicious. Five years old. Here I am walking around stealing Bubblicious. 
Nobody told me to do that. I just knew I want Bubba Wishes. And I knew you're supposed to pay for it, but I would steal it. My mom caught me and made me give it back. How embarrassing. She didn't just put it back. Yeah, this is my mom. Just put the bubble wishes back. No, you're going to tell the manager you were going to steal his bubble wishes. What? Come on. But we look at this and have to recognize the truth for this is God, you are in a relationship with him one way or another. And you may not know that, you may not have known that when you came in today, and, and hopefully you did. Because uh, if you know that you're in a relationship with the God of the universe, I would hope that you would accept the grace and mercy that he has offered you through his son, Jesus Christ. Because the reality of it is, you, the dynamics of your relationship have eternal consequences. And so we, we learn this by understanding the instruction that is valued and, and established within the word of God. Now I would offer to you that the Word of God is every answer to life's questions. And it all begins and ends with Jesus Christ. But it has the answers to all of life's questions. It has answers and instruction on how it is we're to live. I'm going to segue for just a moment. What we're reading here in Romans is, is what we call an epistle. It's a letter to the Roman church. Now pastors, if, let's say Crossroads had multiple churches. And let's say Bill Deller was the bishop. Or whatever. You see this in Catholic churches. They will send out, whether it's geographically, geographically dispersed, you'll send out what's called a pastoral letter to the people. And usually you do this when there's some kind of an issue that's going on. And, and it's done and it's written in the authority of the one who is representing uh, God. And so if you, you may not know this about the dynamics of preachers. Preachers are called to preach God's word. So I'm called to preach to you what God says, not what Steve has to say. Because when we're talking about what Steve has to say, it'd be a terrible thing for everybody. But we were called to preach from God's Word. And so we, we, oftentimes in geographically dispersed areas, what we'll send out is a pastoral letter. It's a letter identifying specifically. Usually it has to deal with a specific issue. I tend not, I like to avoid dealing with, with other organizations or other agencies. And I like to avoid dealing with them because I, I don't like to give any uh, additional, I don't know, any, any additional attention to them. And, and I avoid dealing with them until they step into my wheelhouse. Now, when an organization steps into my wheelhouse, I have the right and the ability to look at and discern what is it they're telling me. Are they telling me what God's Word says, or are they telling me something different? And so, realistically, as soon as somebody invokes the Word of God, then we look at it, we have to judge, and we have to discern. Well, there's an organization called Planned Parenthood. Uh, many of you know it. Um, one of the interesting things, now I'm not going to go into to much detail on but let me, let me rephrase. They, they sent out what's called, or they have what's called, a, a clergy advisory board. The clergy advisory board wrote a pastoral letter to patients. This now brings it into my wheelhouse. This now brings it into the church. Because now you're going to tell me that you have the authority to write this, so now I get to discern and identify under what authority are you writing in this letter, it states, many people wrongly assume that all religious leaders disapprove of abortion. The truth is that abortion is never mentioned in the scriptures, Jewish or Christian. And there are clergy and people of faith from all denominations who support women making this complex decision. The beliefs of each person are deserving of respect and each person deserves care and compassion. I'll agree with that. It goes on further and says, we believe this decision is yours made with your doctor and anyone else you choose to bring into the conversation, such as a spouse, partner, parent, or clergy person. You know, the, the problem I run into is the dynamic of saying God has nothing to say on this issue. Because clearly we're to use the, the scriptures as instructions for our lives. God has a lot to say about this issue. God has a lot to say about every issue in our lives, but specifically surrounding this. Subsequently, I also watched a, and there's an interesting video that's out by Ray Comfort. I think I'll post it on Facebook. If you want to see it, I'll post it on Facebook maybe later today or tomorrow uh, on our the Crossroads Facebook page. But one of the interesting things he does in it is he identifies, you know, most people will say at some point in the womb, there's a baby. Most people will agree to that. And then people will throw out an arbitrary number. Uh, it's at 20 weeks, that's when it's a baby. What happens, I always wonder, what happens at 19 weeks and 6 days? Is there a baby still? 
See, we throw out an arbitrary number to justify and kind of rationalize various things. But that's one of the interesting things. And Ray Comfort asks this question because he gets people to kind of acknowledge it. And he asks this question, well, when is it okay to kill a baby? And most of everybody would say, well, it's not okay to kill a baby. And so we have to really re start to reframe this a little bit. But what's interesting is God has a, a circumstance that he has to deal with the nation of Israel on this very thing. They, they built high places. This is in Jeremiah 32. They built high places of Baal in the valley of Molech, though I did not command them, nor did it enter to my mind that they should do this abomination, abomination <coughs> caused Judah to sin. And we read earlier in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31, they built high places of Topheth, which is the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and daughters in fire, which I did not command, nor did it come to my mind. You may not know what that means, but what the dynamic there of what's happening is they built altars to Molech. Molech was a false god. Where they would build a fire, they, they, the Molech was a statue, they'd build a fire in his belly, and they would heat up the arms, and what they would do is they'd place their babies on the arms and burn them to death. And that's the dynamic. God saying, that, that, never, that never entered my mind that you would ever do that. I'd never commanded it, nor, and so I would never command that. And so we look at that, that's, that's one circumstance. But we also have to look at this in terms of, is there life before we're born? Job mentions in Job chapter 10, verse 11, you clothed me, clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. We have to understand that God is the one and the, 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 dynamic, or the, the one who can determine what life is and the one that can give life. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living creature. We see elsewhere in Acts where Jesus Christ is referred to as the author of life in Acts chapter 3, verse 15. And so we look at this and have to recognize God is the author of life. God is the one that gets to determine when life begins. God is the one that can really dictate. This is not something we're qualified to state. We have to look at this in terms of what does the Word of God say? This is an important topic. Because we have to look at this and say, if I'm wrong, then it's murder. Now, what the dynamic where this is very frustrating, I don't want to minimize the complexity of a decision for somebody in this position. And I guarantee in a room like this, statistically born out, there's at least two, three, four, five of you that have had abortions. We're going to talk about that in a second. Guar I guarantee it. It's just the way it works. There's been over 54 million uh, babies uh, killed since Roe versus Wade back in the 70s. And, and so I guarantee everybody in this room has been touched by it at some, in some regard. So we have to understand what is this? We have to look at this in terms of what does God say about this? Because we're told God says nothing about this. It would have been better for them to say, we have no idea. We're pretty sure God's against it, but we don't want you to think about that. Instead of saying that God has nothing to say. That's a problem for me. And so as we go on, I have to, I have to look at this, but, but really, are we alive before we're born? In Psalm 71, verse 6, the psalmist writes, Upon you I have... Learn, lay, uh, upon you I have leaned before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Psalm 22, 9 through 10. If you know Psalm 22, this is the psalm that Christ quoted as he was on the cross. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. What I believe is happening as we consider this is realistically what we read at the very beginning of this series of what Paul states in Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. They became fools. I believe as a nation, that's where we are. I believe the reality of it is, is the Christians fell asleep at the wheel. And, and we we've, we've falsely allowed this lie to be propagated. I mentioned to you a moment ago that Jesus confronted those who were the religious elite, and He identified who their father was. Saints, who was their father? Satan, the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning and a father of lies. Where would a lie like this come from? It can only come from Satan. 
You see, the reality of it is for us, we have to grasp this, and women have been lied to for years and, and decades that this is, oh, God doesn't have a care about this. This is not, a, that's a flat out lie. And now we get to deal with the consequences of that where women have been broken, husbands and fathers have been broken, siblings have I've missed the growing up with a child, a sibling, because of this lie. So the first thing we have to do is correct the lie and say exactly what, this is a lie. Because we need to heal those who have been impacted by the lie. And if you're a woman who's had an abortion, there is forgiveness, there is mercy, there is grace. God is filled with grace and God loves you. That's the reality of it. That's, that's this God that we serve. God loves you enough that he's willing to give himself up for you. But oftentimes we're, we're told that no, there's no real controversy with this. There's no problem with this. I read an article. I was commenting. I don't know if you saw this YouTube video. I'm not going to encourage you to go watch it. A woman uh, made a video of herself getting an abortion. And all they did was show her face. And they didn't show what was going on down below. And they can't show you what's going to happen a year, two years, ten years from now. But there is a website called abortionmemorial.com. If you're interested in seeing the after effects of the emotional damage that's done. I've sat across in my uh, life as a counselor from women and from fathers who've been impacted by abortion. Who, from women and fathers who at some point recognized, ah, this wasn't okay. And they're left with the trauma and the dirt and the details and the, and the pain from that. And so as we consider this, I'm going to read to you just a couple of stories from this because realistically, I don't want you to be lied to. But I also want you to understand that there is healing, and there is grace, and there is mercy. One woman writes of, uh, this is an abortion that happened in March of this year. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. This song takes on a whole new meaning to me now. I picture you, my baby girl, I believe you're a girl because of the vivid image and dream that I had before I killed you. I'm sorry for being full of fear and not doing what I knew was right. I know that in Christ I am forgiven and that it has been a month since I killed you via the abortion pill. I am trying to forgive myself. The pain and brokenness is unbearable at times. One, things that help, one thing that helps me is knowing you're in heaven and never had to experience the pain of this world. I hope that you can forgive me. It has been tough on your father and I. I have learned to start making my own choices for my life from this experience and not allow anyone else to influence those decisions. Please know that I would give anything to have you back. I miss you and I love you. But it's not just women impacted. There's a father who wrote of an abortion in 1994. I want you to know that I am so sorry. So sorry for what I allowed to have done to you. I was supposed to supposed to protect you and keep you safe, but my selfishness and weakness overcame me. I am and always will be forever uh, be with you, my love. God is so good to forgive me, and I hope you will forgive me for taking life from you. Your mom is good, but was so mixed up and confused. Please forgive her too. Her name is, I won't say her name, you can go and read it yourself. And she, if she could do it over with me, would bring you back in a second to love all the days of our lives. But we can't, so with all of my being, I will love you the rest of my days and await to see you in heaven with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please forgive me for taking your life and robbing you of all that God intended for you to be. I love you, my precious little baby and unborn child, and gift from God. You see, there's a whole other reality that we're not allowed to see. You see, and with this tragedy or with this lie is told to us that this is okay, God doesn't have a, an opinion on this matter. It allows us and design, the design for us to neglect for us to see reality for what it is. You see, understanding that this is what happens allows us to understand the grace and mercy of God. God is interested not just in the big things in your life, not just in the complex decisions, but in every decision you make. So when we look to the Word of God, we look to it for instructions on our lives. Because why? Because God has designed, He's going to reveal Himself to us in the Scripture. And what do we find? We find God's patience. We find God's endurance. We find God's faithfulness. And we rest upon that. Because in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of pain, what do we see? God's grace and God's mercy. 
And for those who have been impacted by this great lie, this great deception that has taken hold of our nation, the reality of it is, is God's mercy and God's grace will be poured out upon you. And that's the fascinating thing about this God that we serve is recognizing and understanding this because the next thing that Paul tells us of the scripture is it allows us to endure. We find our endurance in this. You see, God is faithful to us. God is patient with us. If you look at the history of the nation of Israel, they were a disaster. But God is patient with them. They prostituted themselves out to other gods. They prostituted themselves out to other kings. They were, they, were, they were taken into slavery. But God is faithful. Why? Because in the end, God's will was going to be worked out and the Messiah was going to come through them in order to save the entirety of humanity that will put their faith in Him. God's patience and God's, 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 patience and God's faithfulness will endure. And it will endure in your life. But it only comes from recognizing and understanding who is God. God cares about every decision you make. Those who have walked with God understand this dynamic. We look at our lives and we recognize this. And we thank God for His forgiveness. We thank God for His mercy. But for us as Christians, we have to ask, what am I enduring for? What is the point of all this? I got saved, God take me home. Well, I'm enduring because I want to see Jesus come back. I think that's going to be a cool thing. You come back, and, and I, now I'm a pre-tribulation rapture guy. If you don't know what that means, come to eschatology tonight. But yeah, we, we have this notion that we're going to be taken up, and then we're going to come back, and I want to see people's faces that denied it. Now, that's a bit mean, but that's okay. Give me a little leeway here. But, but we, I want to see people's faces. Here he comes. He's coming in. The trumpets are blared. And here comes Jesus. And he's right in. And he's coming in as the conquering king. And I want to look at the person that I know I've offered the salvation to. And I want to look and say, Ha! I told you. I won't really do that. But wouldn't that be fun? People you've been witnessing to. Laughing at you. And here he comes. See, I told you so. You better get it quick, because he's almost here. <laughs> we have to look at this and recognize, what are we doing? And see, we have here in Romans 5, 8, when Paul states, but God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. And so we get our salvation through that. And then in Psalm 119, this is my comfort and my affliction, that your promise gives me life. You see, one of the misnomers that we have is eternal life begins when I die. My eternal life began the moment I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Can I tell you, saints, if you aren't enjoying life, something went wrong. That doesn't mean you're avoid, you don't experience pain and affliction in this world. That's going to happen. We live in a fallen world. But one of the dynamics of the reality of, of living within the body of Christ is to share this joy with one another. I can't tell you the number of experiences I've had by being a member of the body of Christ and walking with God and walking with some of you. Some of you are crazy. Like the guy that convinced me, come out and brand cows. And then hands me a paddle. Now, I don't know if you know this. You're supposed to hit. Cows are pretty tough. And they're big. And you've got to hit them hard. And I'm kind of tapping them. <laughs> Go, cow. No, you got it. He comes over. Bam! And so then I'm hitting them. And then somebody else, I can't get the cows. And somebody else climbs in. It's his father that climbs in the pen. And I'm swinging now because I got it down. And I'm swinging. Bam, bam, bam. And he climbs in. And I don't notice. So I hit it. Bam! Oh. And I look, and I said, I hit you. And I hit him again. <laughs> Get out of there. That's an experience based upon my role in, in here in working together with the body of Christ. Those are great joys for me to hit you with sticks. <laughs> I get to do that as a pastor. But we get this, those are the things that we have to look at and recognize and understand. We have to live out our faith. You, you got to understand it if you're stuck in sin. And this is why I think Christians who continue to walk in sin and walk in the flesh are some of the most miserable people I know. So the, one of the most joyous ones are to say, hey, I want to walk with God. Woo! And we jump both feet in and start running. And say, God, where are you going to take me? And we, we go on the roller coaster. I think I've, we've got Rebecca back for the weekend. Lee and Rebecca have been on a wild adventure, and it's fun for me to watch because it's them. God moves them out into the middle of nowhere, and then gives them 50 acres. And I have, wait, what I have, God? Where's my 50 acres? You know, this wild ride, man, it's fantastic. And that's a life with Christ. And you, you go in, but you have to be willing to go in. 
And you go through this and God says, hey, I'm going to bring you up and I'm going to build you up in joy. And you're in this body of believers and that's the whole design behind this. Because in the midst of that we find tremendous encouragement even in the times of affliction. Even in the times of pain and even in the times of the heartache. And that's really when we start looking at this, what are those joys, what is that encouragement, what is that instruction that we're given? It's designed to keep us going. Because I know in the end, we win. I read the end of the book, I look at that and say, ha, I win. I knew it. And I could go on with life and if we, we enjoy this eternal life that I've been given. And so we have to look at this and recognize this notion as we understand this, the instruction, it begins with understanding who is God and the instruction of His Word. And as He's revealed Himself, and He finally revealed Himself to us through His Son in these last days. That's what we see in the author of Hebrews stating. And so we come back to this, how do we take all this and bear with the failures of others? Because really, that sucks. I mean, come on, let's be realistic. If somebody's failing, it's not the most fun to go in and say, oh, you're failing, let me help you. But have you ever sat with somebody who's in the middle of pain and you never had the right words? Yes. And sometimes all you can do is cry. But then you watch them as they cling to God and they cling to Christ. And you're a part of that experience. You're a part of that. You see, sometimes when others are failing, what I like to look at and what I like to see is what is God going to do with this person? My job is to draw them back to Christ. My job is to draw them in to go deeper and to grow stronger with Jesus. <clears throat> because his, He is the model. And the reality is we don't have room for false teaching. I've already, I think I've covered that one pretty well. But the other aspect of this model is the sacrifice of ourselves to bring others to Christ into a right relationship with God and then to build others up into a deeper relationship with God. And we do that by being in the game. Not being sidelined Christians. Getting plugged in with a body of believers. Getting plugged in where you're going to be fed. Getting plugged in to a body, of, a group of Christians who are active in seeking out God in their lives. Because it is through that that God works wonderful miracles in your own life. And you've got to watch. You know what a joy it is to watch a miracle happen to somebody else? <coughs> That's one of the fascinating things that we get. You get a front line seat to watch all these miracles. I told a pastor once, somebody had asked me, what's cool, and I, and cool about being a pastor? I said, man, I get a front row. I, get, I see all miracles all the time. And that's one of the cool parts about being in the game. You get to watch this unfold right in front of your eyes. You look at this and say, man, this is amazing. You watch somebody who was once a sinner turn their lives over to Christ, and then all of a sudden end up in Guatemala for some reason. And it's just a head spinning. As a year ago, I don't know what I was doing, but now I'm in Guatemala, and now I want to go back. <coughs> Yeah, you can watch things like these are amazing things that happen. And you get a front row seat to that. But it requires those of us who are more mature in the faith. That doesn't mean more mature by age. What that means is more mature and growing in their relationship with Christ. To bear with the failings of others. Why? Because the failings of others is what makes us strong. You see, we get to watch God work in the life of those who are failing. And we get to see these wonderful, gracious things that occur as God unfolds himself and reveals himself to people. Secondly, our, our submission is to Christ. Now we know, and many of you know, I, I serve in the military. And it's an honor to serve this nation. And, and I look at that, and, and most of us would agree that, that anybody that serves, and we serve realistically what has been the greatest nation in the history of the world. I think we're in a bit, a bit of a bad spot right now. And we've got a window of time where we can turn. But realistically, really, but I look at this and say, you know, what greater purpose is there than to serve the God of the universe? Amen. Can you think of what is there that is a greater purpose than serving the God of the universe? The God who designed everything. And he says, I want you to serve me. Now that's a fantastic and wonderful <coughs> privilege that we have. But it requires us to submit ourselves unto him. And then thirdly, our lives are lived to Christ. Our lives are geared towards living out our faith in Jesus Christ. And that allows us to model the intention of God in our lives, constantly seeking unity in Christ. You see, one of the fascinating things within the body of Christ is this notion of unity. <coughs> but not unity in what I've called to a mission, but unity in what God has called to a mission. Not unity in what we think God wants us to do, but unity in what we know God wants us to do, and that is to glorify Him. 
You see, one of the beautiful things about the body of Christ is this opportunity to join together with other Christians to glorify God in our actions, in our works, and in our voices as we sing worship and praises, as we engage in service and serving others. But it starts with this notion of being a part of the body of Christ. If that's not you, if you're not a part of the body of Christ, if you haven't accepted the gracious gift that God has offered you through Christ, why not? What's in your way? What is it that gets in your way of accepting a gift? And perhaps you don't believe in God. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're like, you know, I don't know if this God thing's real. We're told, Paul identifies, we see this in the psalmist, the, the, the heavens declare God's glory. The world declares the glory of God. And he says, I don't know if I believe that. Ask anybody in here, what miracle has happened in their lives because I guarantee those who are sitting in here if they have committed their lives to Christ they've received a miracle the Amen. salvation that they've been given Amen. so if that's you maybe you're ah, not that if you're a Christian and you're not plugged in why not nowhere in the Bible does it say a Christian should be out on their own you gotta know that <laughs> everywhere it says they're probably supposed to be a part of the body of Christ everywhere and maybe you're like, man, this pastor talks too long. It's 11.15. I'm hungry. Amen. I, got, I got Tim in the back. Tim say, man, it's time to go. What's going on? We're halfway done. <laughs> this is the first slide of the next sermon. But we have to look at this. We really have to get in this. And, and what I want you to understand is that I forgot where I was going with that. That's what I wanted you to understand. But what, what we have to look at this is recognize that the truth of this is even if, if, if you're sitting here and say, man, this dude's a windbag. That's fine. Because I know a pastor down the road that'll take you in his church. And I know if you're not in there, I don't live here. I'll find you a church to get plugged into. Just let me know. I got no problem with that. I want people to grow in their faith, grow in their love. I want people to experience the joy of being united with other Christians <coughs> in Christ. And going out and impacting the world because you see it all starts with you submitting yourself to Christ and getting plugged in to the body of Christ because the reality of it is is you are stronger in the body of Christ than you will ever be on your own. Mm. That goes both with dealing with issues in your life as well as your faith in Jesus Christ. And with that, let's pray. Our gracious Father, Lord, I pray that whatever in this sermon is of you would stick if there's anything that's not, Lord, that will just fade away. Lord, I pray for those here who are not saved, who are not a part, have not, are not a part of your body, not a part of those who have received Christ. Father, you make it plainly clear how simple this salvation is. Confessing with our mouths that Jesus is, is the King, Lord, and, and believing in our hearts that you have raised him from the dead. How simple this salvation is, and yet how convoluted and difficult we make it. I pray, Lord, if there are roadblocks in people's lives, that you would remove those roadblocks and that they would seek to receive you. And Father, for those of us who are have walked with you for a while, who find ourselves in difficult, in difficult situations or, or various circumstances, Lord, I pray for the body of Christ to come around them and surround them with for those who are struggling with various issues, Lord, I pray that they would plug in to the body of Christ. And if that be here, Lord, fantastic. That we can help them and we can support them and we can build them up in you. <coughs> Lord, that together we can glorify your name. And Father, I, I appreciate and thank you for this body of believers. What a fantastic thing that you've given us this life together, that we can grow together and love together, share in the joys of life and the pains of life, that we do this together and all to bring glory to you. What a glorious thing, God. We pray this in Jesus' name.